What kind of American are you? <laughs> the movie Civil War by Alex Garden is not actually about a civil war itself. Indeed, it is a drama about journalists on a road trip through an American civil war. The potential disappointment of those viewing to see how a civil war might get started or even progress, uh, journalism is the center of the story. Yet, there are a few things that are instructed to those of us who want to be prepared. I will follow up with another video in the next few days explaining how we may already be in a civil war. Stay tuned for that. I am Greg Allison on my channel, Green Greg. Subscribe and bang the bell. I will unpack the lessons to the preppers among us as I go through the key points of the plot. But first, let me say there is no way the war would have ended this way. Spoiler alert. I cover the plot and will show you at the end of this video why the scenes at the White House would never have occurred. As much as the tactics and the weapons they used were wrong, I will cover a bit of that too as I go through the plot. Now, Alex Garland was intentionally uh, pairing California and Texas together to stay out of the politics of America. That allowed him to focus on journalism, but mainly enabled the movie to appeal to both the left and the right sides of the American political divide. Of course, provide more box office sales, oh yeah, that was a smart business move, but it left many attendees asking a lot of questions. Uh, you don't get how the war started. What motivated the hatred and carnage depicted therein? All you hear is that the president is currently in his third term in office and that he conducted airstrikes on civilians, which is quite likely to provoke very intense hatred and he suspended the FBI. The latter might be a matter that many might celebrate. <laughs> Some might suppose, however, that big state authoritarian president and an agency like the FBI would be a natural marriage of like minds, but uh, one made somewhere other than in heaven. <laughs> None of the alliances in this movie nor the way the country is broken up make any sense given the nature of politics in America today. But then again, that too was intentional. The plot. The main protagonist is Lee Smith, a battle-worn, emotionless, renowned war photographer. She is played by Kirsten Dunst, Spider-Man's girlfriend. Oh yeah, maybe kissing a spider would zap the bullshit from anyone. <laughs> Her and her colleague, Joel, plan to visit Washington, D.C. to photograph and interview the president. They are joined by Sammy, the older, much wiser of the group, and a younger aspiring journalist, Jesse Cullen, who didn't come into it initially. The movie starts with a news piece of the president declaring a great victory in battle as certain his triumph is imminent, the greatest military achievement in history, perhaps. Ah, uh, proof no one should listen to a politician, right? <laughs> We see a scene of a clash between New York City cops and rioters. Jesse encounters, uh, excuse me, Lee encounters Jesse there and pulls her out of the line of fire to encourage her to wear armor and appropriate clothing, inadvertently saving her from a bomb blast as she has jerked her behind an NYPD car that blocked the blast. Lee gives Jesse an emergency vest so that she doesn't appear to be either a cop or a rioter. A uh, prepper lesson, be the gray man and or wear body armor whenever possible. In some cases, looking like a member of the press or an emergency worker might be better if you get too close to the action. That is, if you're not a combatant. <laughs> uh, anyway, they gather at a hotel where the lights are on and everything appears to be normal, except that Lee is warned by the staff to walk up 10 flights of stairs to a room as the elevator can go out. <laughs> Prepper lessons. One, if you suspect that there's potential for the power to go out, don't take an elevator. Two, in times of distress, you don't want to be way up on a high rise uh, as you will have to look all of your supplies up many flights of stairs. And should you be lucky enough that the firehouses are still operational, 
they may not be able to service your level due to a lack of water pressure and potential for failing equipment. If the grid is down, and uh, the firemen are probably at home taking care of mom and the kids. Civil services like fire and police broke down in New Orleans in about three days after Hurricane Katrina, uh, and many emergency workers left their post immediately. In fact, uh, this, this is a huge concern when uh, you have uh, civil strife. Uh, as the, at the hotel bar, we meet Sammy, Lee's mentor. He uh, warns them against going to D.C., explaining that journalists are shot there on site, failing to dissuade them. Uh, he requests to go with them to Charlottesville, where the Texas and California Western Forces, WF, are gathered for a last-ditch assault. Lee is hesitant at first, but uh, then her and Joel agree to bring him along. Jessie uh, tracks Lee to the hotel, supposedly returning the vest that she was given at that riot. She uh, appeals to Lee to join her, but Lee burns her. Uh, Lee is unaware that Joel, later persuaded by Jessie, brings her along. Looks to her chagrin. Uh, the group leaves the city and stops at a rural gas station guarded by armed men. Uh, the place looks rather sketchy. Joel is hesitant to go in. But why is Sammy advises to get fuel whenever the opportunity avails itself? Prepper lesson. My old advice is, for anything is get it while the getting's good. You don't want to run out of fuel on a road trip, and fuel may be almost impossible to find in trying times. With a bicycle tire pump, some hose pipe, and hose clamps, you might manage to pump fuel from the ground tank at a closed down gas station. You got to remember to prime the line and pump first too, right? Uh, with a sharp pick, uh, in a pan, uh, you might be able to get some from derelict vehicles. Be careful, you might get shot doing that. <laughs> uh, make sure they're derelict and abandoned, maybe in the road somewhere. Just make sure not to mix up gas and diesel fuel. Uh, then you, you're going to have some serious problems. Uh, because the U.S. dollar has lost its value due to the conflict in this movie, they wind up purchasing their gas using Canadian dollars. Proper lesson, in a grid down or civil strife situation, the dollar may become essentially worthless. How some other means to barter with. Currently, the BRICS organization is trying to take down our dollar. A good option might be to check out the gold backs and other options at defythegrid.com. Use the discount code GREEDGRIGS to get 1% off. Links are in the show notes and pin notes below. Anyway, after Jesse sneaks into a local car wash next to the gas station, she discovers two tortured guys suspended from the ceiling. Jesse was followed there by one of the attendants who accuses those guys of robbing the establishment. Jesse was distraught and had put herself in potential danger. Lee comes along and defuses the detention by snapping a picture of the man uh, with his victims. Uh, once they're gone, Jesse criticizes herself for losing it due to shock and not taking a single photo. I mean, how can she be a photojournalist if she can't take the photo under stress? She's still young, she's still naive, and then, but she becomes seasoned as the journey continues. She thinks she could have uh, asked the captor not to shoot one of the victims. Joel asserts that the captor would have done that anyway. Lee instructs her that their job is just to take the photos, not to get involved and let the viewers be the judge. Yeah, being the battle-hardened uh, photojournalist that she is. After spending the night close to the conflict, the group records the battle the next day as a group of fighters attack a structure that is occupied by opposing combatants. One fighter is pinned behind the post uh, by opposing fire, which somehow fails to take him out, even though he's somewhat exposed to either side until he makes a run for it under the cover of some smoke in his comrade's uh, cover fire, which obviously was not sufficient to keep him from being hit by the fire. There was a realistic scene of his combats dressing his wound afterwards. Prepper lessons. One, uh, if you can be seen, you can be shot maybe in just a couple of seconds. His fellow combatants failed to put down sufficient suppressive fire to make the enemy take cover while he made his run. Of course, it was a high rise. There was many points that they could have popped up and shot from. So it wasn't really such a great thing. Also remember this. 
The pads ladies use for their periods make great bandages to cover sucking chest wounds. And in fact, those pads were derived from bandages developed for that purpose or so I've been told back when I was in the army and wore this very uniform. <laughs> uh, but anyway, do have something to tie and hold it in place. Uh, when uh, they attack, the squad moves into the building. And, you know, they're, they're trying to be under cover. And when they get in the building, they turn the headlights on their uh, helmets on, their helmet headlights. Stupid. Oh, my Lord. Proper lesson goes back to what can happen when you can be seen. Don't telegraph your positional lights if you can avoid it, especially bright white lights. Why does anyone have uh, in this movie not have night vision gear? You know, you should have night vision gear, night vision gear, something like that, if you're going to be in tactical situations like that. But nobody in the movie had any. Well, it was a Hollywood production. What do you expect? Okay. Soldiers were then ca captured hooded, and walked out to be executed. The thrill of the shooter took in his actions was rather disturbing. Ah, anyway, prepper lesson. Hatred escalates, inducing people to commit heinous acts that you might not expect. Be prepared for the worst. No one was taking any prisoners in this movie. Uh, why would the executioners have allowed incriminating photographs of that to have been taken? I had many questions like that in this movie. Lee recognizes Jesse's ability as a combat photographer after seeing Jesse take pictures of that execution. Prepper lesson. You may not want to let people know what you have witnessed, especially if you think that, especially if they think that you might expose them. And that becomes a problem later in this movie. The group then stays overnight at a camp of refugees. They drink and party. Uh, into the night uh, is a mental escape from the carnage all around. That can be expected. The next day, Jessie uh, shows Lee how she develops her black and white film uh, with development footage that she keeps next to her body, which keeps it just the right temperature. Lee herself uses all digital equipment. They grow closer as Lee takes on the role of protector and mentor of Jessie. Prepper lesson. Unlike this movie, when the, where the lights are still on to create a dystopian image of normalcy in the midst of carnage, and times of tension do not rely solely on high technology devices. They may fail you, even if protected by Faraday cages. Next, they travel to a small town where it looks like no war is going on. The lawns are being watered and people uh, go about whatever other normal daily lives are just trying to be blissfully ignorant. Now, the birds are chirping, and, you know, there's toys in the yards. Joel and Jesse go into a clothing store. Jesse sees the attendant casually reading the book and asks, are you guys aware there's a pretty huge civil war going on all across America? She replies, we just try to stay out with what we see on the news. It seems like it's for the best. Upon leaving the store, Lee is shown gunmen standing on the roofs of the buildings all around by Sammy, the wise one. That's how this small town managed normalcy in the midst of war, like a mini Switzerland, neutral but armed to the teeth. <laughs> Prepper lesson. Good defenses are paramount in trying times. Form your community and uh, family groups uh, or form mutual assurance groups, mutual assistance groups, whatever you want to call them, uh, however you can. Just make sure to be careful to vet everyone in a group before you join one or anyone you bring into one, especially if you're the sponsor of a group. It is a lot like getting married. And given the divorce rates these days, we're not so good at that. All right, now are we? Yeah, see? Uh, to assist you in forming groups, we here on Green Rex have formed survivaltribenetwork.com. Check it out. Cost you nothing but time. Might save your life. Later in the runs of the shutdown at a shutdown Christmas fair, the SUVs are hit by gunfire and being held down. Uh, they make an escape fort under the cover of a building, some other vehicles. Uh, they encounter a group of snipers there trying to take out the very snipers that shot at the journalist vehicle. Joel tries to find out whose party they're fighting for, but the snipers kind of make fun of him and tell him that uh, they're only trying to survive just like their enemy in a nearby house, there's no indication of who is on what side, except for opposite 
they're on opposite sides of smoke and muzzles. Ah, prepper lesson. There may be many sides in the Civil War, including criminals, warlords, lone wolves, and other fractured groups. Battle lines may not be clear, so be very wary. In this movie, both sides are pretty much wearing the same camo uniforms. Be very careful. Just remember, in a war, many are lost to what's called friendly fire. Seems too friendly if you're on the receiving end, if it's coming from your own guys. In the Ukraine war, Russians mark their vehicles with Zs, and Ukrainian soldiers often wear either blue or yellow tape. Uh, but as Jesse observes more fatalities and grows closer to Lee as a mentor, her courage increases. Her photo photographic abilities advance also. And a crashed helicopter in an abandoned mall with a uh, J.C. Penney's in the background, Lee asks Jesse to take a photograph of it. When Jesse wonders if Lee would take a picture of of herself dying, Lee answers, what do you think? Insinuating that she would. In the end, it turns out to be the other way. Hmm. Uh, spoiler alert, right? The four run into Tony and Bohe, two other reporters that are friends of George. They come up behind them in a speeding vehicle as they are driving. Uh, Tony and Jesse carelessly change uh, vehicles by crawling through the windows of the SUV speeding side by side down the road. Bohe and Jesse Speed ahead of the uh, others, which alarms Lee as uh, they lose sight of them. It's, boom, they're gone. Lee, Joel, Sammy, and Tony find Bo Hayes' abandoned SUV later down the road. They depart from their SUV to investigate. They see that Jesse and Bo Hayes have been taken prisoner by uh, an apparent execution squad disposing of bodies in a mass grave from the back of a dump truck. Jesse and Bo Hayes are being held at gunpoint. Lee, Joel, and Tawny want to go save their friend. Sammy warns that th that it is death to do so. He warns that the militants are disposing of civilian bodies and don't want anyone to know about that. Lee, Joel, and Tawny proceed against Sammy's advice and chide him for being a little too old, maybe a little too heavy to do the same, at which Sammy grimaces uh, as he clearly wanted to go himself. Prepper lesson. People do heinous things in bad times. If you happen to witness such a thing, watch out. Kind of like when I was talking about the execution earlier. To me, this is one of the most disturbing scenes in the movie. Joel tells the militants that uh, they are just journalists, and Bohe and Jesse are his comrades. The militant in charge, the short-haired redhead with the red glasses, immediately turns and shoots Bohe. Joel thinks fast, recovering from his gut reaction, and tells him, uh, there's some kind of misunderstanding. We are all Americans, he says. Red queries. The most famous line in the movie. Okay, what kind of Americans are you? Each tells which state they're from. But then when Tony responds, Hong Kong, the terrorist says China and shoots him uh, with, uh, and then arms his, aims his weapon at the others. Suddenly, slant, Sammy slams into Red and one of the other, uh, one of his other partners running him over with the SUV. After Sammy runs over the two militants, he saves the group, telling them to get in the SUV. Unfortunately, a third militant comes out of the dump truck and shoots him through the vehicle as they rush away. No good deed goes unpunished. Uh, the role of Red, unnamed in the video, was played by none other than Kristen Durst's husband, Jesse Flemons, who is also an actor. No, not Spider-Man. <laughs> The guy slated for the role had quit. Playing such a bad guy is a hard rap. Uh, when the original actor quit, Carson said, hey, Jesse's here. He was there to watch her filming, right? You know, supporting his wife. So he got the role. But the role was not credited in the film, and Jesse wore the crazy red glasses to try to mask his identity. His wife had said that he had went through hundreds of them in various shops in uh, Atlanta or somewhere in Georgia trying to find something to hide behind. Well, his cover is blown. Maybe he should have worn a Spider-Man's mask after all. <laughs> to his unaccredited credit, Jesse did an excellent job playing a hard-to-bear role. Got to hand that to him. Ah, uh, Anyway, I struggled here with the question, what kind of message was Alex Gar Garland trying to put forth? Was it about racism? The mass grave had people of different races in it, so that was not it. The mass grave had, uh, uh, well, Garland was largely trying to avoid politics. But was it a ding on anti-immigration sentiments in America? 
I have posted videos myself here on this channel that are against having unvetted immigrants coming into this country and have called for a legal process where we know who is coming in this country, who and what, basically, not just who, but what also. Uh, we have heard from none less than they had the Iranian Revolutionary Guard that they have sleeper cells just waiting to take out 20 of our critical large uh, transformer electrical power stations. I've said that many times here. Uh, they could take down our entire electric grid upon which all of our other critical structure is reliant. We have criminals here such as MS-13. How did they get here? How does fentanyl come across into our country? What about that lab they discovered, that Chinese bio, web, uh, bio lab they discovered in Reedy, California? How does all that stuff get here? And that fentanyl, that stuff is costing us uh, over 100,000 Americans a year. So clearly something ought to be done. I just want a legal process for what crosses our border. Is that too much to ask for? Some mistake that is anti-immigrant. That's a far cry from the truth. My last wife was an immigrant. She's now a U.S. citizen. Anyway, prepper lesson. When society collapses, there will be those willing to attack anyone they do not identify with. These identity divisions could be based on race, religion, nationality, uh, politics, family alliances as feuds can spring up, or simply, you're not from around here, now are you? <laughs> Many communities will just not accept the outsiders in bad times. With the threats that abound, can you blame them? Uh, for this, stay situationally aware. Keep your eyes wide open and head on a swivel, as I always tell you. Upon reaching the Western Forces uh, military camp in Charlottesville, the gang experiences many forms of grief. Lee snaps a uh, picture of Sammy's body and quickly removes it. And she just can't stand it on her camera. Uh, Joel starts acting frantic after drinking alcohol. He is really distraught, gut-wrenchingly so. The group is informed by uh, two other reporters that the Western invasion is on the horizon and the government's top generals have largely capitulated leaving Washington, D.C. essentially undefended. They uh, follow the Western forces into Washington, D.C. Lee is unable to shoot photos while experiencing a brief episode of post-traumatic stress disorder, disorder, PTSD. It catches up to her uh, for a bit, and then she cracks, uh, for a bit at least. Uh, one of my biggest tactical complaints I have is that the helicopter gunship comes in near the White House gate, hovering in the middle of a canyon of high-rise buildings. Remember what I said? If you can be seen, the helicopter is a big stationary target. Out in the wide open, exposed to all manner of potential sniping positions from those villains. All I could think was Black Hawk Down. Remember that movie? No one in the right mind outside of Hollywood would put an attack helicopter in a position like that. Prepper lesson. When in combat, don't expose yourself. As uh, we learn later, Jesse did. Uh, anyway. The presidential limousine caravan makes an abortive attempt to escape the besieged White House. The caravan is taken out by Western forces as they think the president made a run for it. After it crashes, Lee recovers from her PTSD as her intuition tells her the president's still inside the structure. She then takes the group inside. After that, the Western forces squad follows the journalist in, tells them to not get in the way, and engages with combat with the remaining Secret Service agents one of whom is stationed in a press room and is trying in vain to negotiate with the Western Forces squad to arrange for the president to be transported safely to Greenland or Alaska. They ask her to take them to the president and then swiftly take her out when she does not rapidly comply. They don't give her any time. Uh, in the hallway, leading to the Oval Office, Jesse exposes herself to uh, take a picture uh, of the ensuing gunfight. She's right in the middle of the hallway and the wide open in the West Wing. Lee pushes Jesse to safety, basically pushes her down in the floor as she puts herself at risk and gets shot. As Lee is shot dead in the crossfire, Jesse takes pictures of her. Uh, she saved Jesse. Again, no good deed goes unpunished. The president is apprehended by the Western Forces squad in the Oval Office. Joel asked the Western Forces squad to hold off from executing him while he obtains a quote. 
The unkempt president, lying in the floor after being dragged from behind his desk, pleads with Joel to spare him, imploring, don't let them kill me. Joel answers, yes, that will suffice. This is quote. Jesse snaps a picture of the, West, of the president's quick execution while its corpse is being posed by grinning members of the Western forces. Uh, anyway, it is never explained in this movie why they had to shoot on sight orders, uh, why the hatred was so intense. No one got away and there were no prisoners taken in the movie. Everyone captured was executed. Uh, while it made the plot work for the journalist, I must now explain why this scene would have never happened. No, even if the president had not managed to escape well in advance aboard Air Force One, Marine Force One, a special helicopter, or other means uh, to one of the many federal facilities outside D.C. or another country, which I suspect he would have, he has a lot of escape tunnel options. There are a lot of tunnels on Capitol Hill and under the White House itself. Let me show you some of the ones we know about. I myself have run uh, through the ones on Capitol Hill back when I was executive vice president, chairman of the, the uh, chairman of the policy committee of the National Space Society. Now, let me go to share here, share screen. Give me a second here. Bada bing, bada bang, and right here we are. All right, White House Treasury Building Tunnel. Here we are, guys. This was built, a uh, 761-foot tunnel. It was built back in 1941 to allow the evacuation of the president from the White House to underground vaults inside the Treasury uh, in an emergency. Because they got quite a few vaults in this Treasury building. Let's look at it here. Bang. So here's the West Wing. It would come underneath the road here and be over here. Well, of course, since then, they built many other tunnels and uh, bunkers, a bunker, the uh, situation room also, and, and the White House itself. So... But this was built, in, this tunnel was built in 1941. That is one option that we know of. Uh, but there's others. That's not the only one. Uh, back in uh, a few years later, after World War II was over, and between 1949 and 1952, the entire interior of the White House was rebuilt. The whole thing was gutted. And they put in a lot of tunnels and other escape uh, means while they did this. You can see from this picture here, Inside the White House, dump trucks and bulldozers. Yeah, they're quite at work. They built the basement out and other things. So, see the in fact, uh, Truman's wife's uh, piano or something actually had, a, I believe, a, a leg that fell through one of these dilapidated floors in one of the buildings, believe it or not. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> so the White House had some bad problems. It seriously needed some repair. So let's go down here. Uh, yeah, you can see there's a lot of work inside the White House. And yeah, they added more tunnels at that time. And you can see here, work on underground facilities in the forward part of the White House. It's not where the West Wing is. It's not the backside where we traditionally think of bunkers, but they did a lot of interior finishes in the front end. All of them, you don't know about. You know, they don't tell you about it. We do know that there is a, a hidden hallway from the Oval Office it goes straight down in these tunnels, as uh, as you will find throughout the West Wing and other areas. Probably also what we don't know about is one, most likely in the president's residence itself. Now here's some photographs of the White House tunnels uh, being constructed at that time. Now you can see this is kind of adjacent to where that other picture was at the front of the White House. Uh, so yeah, they're doing some serious digs and you can see it comes around the other side. I love these old vehicles here. Look at that. <laughs> it would be nice to have one of those. Again, inside the White House, really digging down. Is that going to be a tunnel there? Check that out, that cover there. They backfill it. And here is a tunnel under the White House with a cover, which I kind of wonder if that was the construction they were doing there. Very traditional kind of tunnel. This is underneath the White House, east view of White House Tunnel. That's not the one built the treasure building. That was one built afterwards. This is one that they let us see. What else is there? What do we not know? What do we not see? Are they, do they have other tunnels? I would kind of suspect as much. Would you not think they got other tunnels? I would think so. So 
there you have it on that. So let's have some look at some other things. This is kind of a look at uh, tunnels going underneath the Capitol building. You know, they did a big dig behind the Capitol, but even before they did that, they had tunnels that went all these other uh, congressional and, uh, and Senate House of Representatives and Senate office buildings. I, these are the tunnels I have run through, initially through these, and these were landed later back in here. So there are quite a number of tunnels in that area. And some of them, like this center one, actually has little uh, uh, unmanned cars that whisk them around. I did not go into one of those tunnels. You know, the ones I was in, you had to do a lot of walking. But it was faster than the walking on the sidewalks and surface. I don't remember. Maybe they had moving sidewalks. I don't remember now. It's been a while back. Yeah, I've seen tunnels that were like that in there. So it's just an example of what you would see. Oh, there's a down arrow. Let's just go to. Okay, so this keeps going. Anyway, so let's go on over here. Do you see underground atlas? Just talking again, this is a Capitol Hill tunnels here. And of course, there's the subways and uh, you got the aqueducts and sewers and all that stuff. So here's a funny thing about the moon. It's the whole division aspect of everything. You see blue is so-called loyalist states, which are the union uh, the, the president was heading up what was left of the United States. The Western forces are in green. The Florida alliance is in red, and the New People's Army is in uh, kind of a gold color up here. They don't go through, whoops, and explain a lot. I wish just more details and go down. They don't explain a lot. There we go. They don't explain a lot about this in the movie. It's just kind of casually and quickly shown. They don't go into any detail about it. There's a little map flashed of it. A little and very little discussion, but um, <clears throat> basically, it's everybody against the blue. Now, you think uh, <laughs> that's an odd division, and for Alaska to be with them, the loyalist forces with the federal government seems kind of odd. You think Alaska and Texas would be on the same side as most mountain states in the South, and you think South Carolina would definitely be on the side with Alabama and Tennessee, Georgia? I don't know. Georgia's getting a little fickle lately. But you would expect to see a little different map than this, given the politics that we have today as to who would side with who. But then you're talking left-right politics. And uh, Alex Garland clearly wanted to avoid it. I just wanted to show you this map. It's got very little, actually nothing to do with the reality of what might transpire in a situation like that. So, my friends, uh, I'm going to stop the share. So I will be doing another video soon. I will cover uh, the fact that we may already be in a civil war of sorts. That Seriously, it may be worse than a lot of people think already. Just kind of covertly running quietly, uh, at least a civil cold war. And it may have hot pockets. So this is something I will cover soon. Oh, yeah, by the way, like I said, this was my uniform when I was in the Army. See my name on it here. I just barely can get back in it now. I've been losing weight. <laughs> so I can't even bottom. I can't yet button the bottom buttons, and it is mighty tight right here. But it's kind of amazing to put this thing on again after so many years. I was issued this when I was at Fort Greeley, Alaska. Prior to there, we had the, just the green olive drab uniform. We didn't have all this camel color, and this is not the camel pattern they use today. That's the Darkom patch I wore at Fort Greeley. Oh, yeah, somebody left a comment in the comment section wanting to know if my hair was glued under my hat. They didn't think it was real. So let me just show you guys. <laughs> it's very real. <laughs> you see? <laughs> Speaking about hand under my hat, there you go. I don't like to do a video without my hat on. <laughs> so there we go, my friends. That is... Uh, my summary of this video, of this movie, it was not about civil war, and it didn't tell you how it would occur, or how it would come about, uh, or anything that would lead you to some political understanding of how we get there. But it was a movie about the dystopian picture in America. They did do flashbacks to war scenes all over the world, and they showed those kind of scenes here in America. That's what a lot of people don't believe can happen. So they did that intentionally. It was kind of hit the gravity of what it could be. And honestly, a civil war in this country would be a very, very ugly, nasty affair. We don't want it, if you think back to the history of when we had one back during the war between the states. 
that was that war took out more Americans than any all the wars put together until we got up to you know just the last couple of decades. It was horrendous, very horrendous. We lost almost as many people in the Battle of Gettysburg as the Vietnam War took out. 50,000 in the Battle of Gettysburg. The entire Vietnam War over 12 years took out 54,000 by comparison. So we don't want no stinking civil war. If we can avoid it, uh, it may come to us, like it or not. In which case, you've got to be very, very careful. So let's hope it don't come to that. Let's hope if the nation has to split, we have a peaceable divorce. Uh, but guys, just keep in mind that uh, we don't know what's coming down the road. It won't go down like this movie, but something may be coming. So stay tuned for my next movie. Uh, subscribe, bang the notification bell, and click off. Share my videos far and wide. And I want to thank you one and all for watching. And with that, I am going to say uh, happy, hearty, Greg out.